Welcome everybody. This is Zach Parnell with ITI. Uh, you're at the uh, ITI Showcase webinar. If you're, if you're in the wrong place, feel free to click out, but I think everyone here is supposed to be here. Uh, we welcome you and just thank you so much for attending. We're, I'm really excited today to have Sheldon and Rob on the call with me. I'm going to get into their uh, bios a bit and they have really, they're sort of at the cutting edge of what's coming in the training and competency assessment world. So that's going to be the topic of our discussion today. Uh, as people start pouring in, we'll get we'll get into the introductory slides and get started. So I, I want to give you a brief idea of who we are as we talk about why ITI is involved with ICAB a bit and, and Sheldon and Rob. ITI is an industrial training international. We provide corporate training solutions essentially for on subjects of cranes, rigging, lift planning, and engineering. Uh, we really focus on all heavy industries across the world, as you can see here, um, and we exist to serve and learn every day. I wanted to let you know that this webinar is being brought to you also by Lifting Gear Hire. They help um, sponsor these webinars to uh, fund them essentially, and they're an outstanding organization that focuses on renting lifting gear for unique applications like uh, jacks and hoists and tuggers and even hydraulic skidding systems of all things. So they're a very, very well-known company uh, in throughout the North America. And uh, if you have never heard of them or utilized them, feel free to take down their information now or check out their website. Uh, ITI essentially conducts training at customer locations and training centers. We have facilities from Edmonton and Anchorage, Washington State, Cleveland, Memphis, now Houston coming up soon. Uh, but the thing we're going to talk a lot about today is actually online technologies. So we have a large e-learning library, um, and I'll, we'll get into that shortly. And like I mentioned, we touch on from everything from cranes and rigging to engineering. Uh, we do a lot of technical services as well for customers like uh, procedure manuals and uh, audits and accident investigations, uh, as well as a lot of digital solutions like these webinars. Uh, I operate our company as president. I really enjoy content and instructional design. That's probably what really gets me up in the morning. And uh, we love working with ITI with the companies like Mammut and Suncor and others solving their um, training and really workforce development problems. Our first speaker is uh, Sheldon Redpath. Uh, Sheldon's a great guy. He actually just relocated in the past year from Edmonton to Houston. So he's gone through a massive life change, and uh, he's the global head of safety, health, environment, and quality at Mammut, uh, based in Houston. He's got 20 years, over 20 years, of building risk mitigation strategies, and he's worked around the world. Uh, you know, I guess the guy is constantly on planes to um, the Netherlands and beyond, and he'll probably share a little bit about that with you. Uh, Rob Day is also joining us. He's a senior regulatory advisor. Uh, he does a lot of consulting work for Suncor Energy and has been, I think, the key proponent of uh, implementing ICAB at Suncor, which is the program, the International Competency Assessment Board, that Sheldon and Rob will be talking to you about today. Um, so Rob is really an expert in risk management. Uh, I think he currently lives in Alberta, but he's worked throughout North America, UK, and China. I wanted a quick housekeeping item to give you an update on this. You can update us with questions or comments on the right in the pane for GoToWebinar. So if you have any questions as, as these guys are going through the content today, uh, feel free to put them in there. I will be uh, transcribing them, and we hope to get to them at the end of the topic or discussion. But uh, if we can't answer them right in line with the presentation, we will. Okay. So Sheldon, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we can uh, get going. All right. Thanks, Zach. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Are you hearing me all right there, Zach? Yes, sir. Good. Just want to make sure my mic's working. All right. Welcome, everyone, and, and thanks, Zach, for letting us um, present the case that we wanted to go through and, and give everyone on the call an idea of some of the innovative things that we're working on. Um, we're going to speak today. Um, Rob and I are going to give you all a briefing on an innovative system um, that we've been working on aimed at using technology to streamline training and competency process for crane and, and uh, riggers, so individuals that work in the crane and transport industry. 
So we wanted to um, explain that to you, help uh, give you an understanding of what it is that, that we've um, been working on behind the scenes, and then invite uh, participants to actually participate in building a collaborative type community um, that we'll explain here more in a minute. So with that, I just wanted to um, you know, go through a slide just showing that over the years, the centuries, we've actually increased our capacity related to uh, lifting and transport. So the slide just going through some of the innovations and things that have, have um, transpired over the years. We've always been you know, innovative and, and not only Mammut being a market leader, but also other companies out there have, have improved the industry and the capacity. So we're you know, currently at roughly 4,000 tons for lifting and for transporting 36,000 tons you know, of our capacity. So this graph just shows the exponential increase over the years that has happened. So um, it gives you an idea that, that obviously our industry is, is constantly evolving and improving. With that though um, has come the um, incidents that go with it. So, so we've had all this technology or innovation. With it is equipment that is very powerful. When something goes wrong, it's pretty catastrophic. So the pictures flashing in front of you are just examples of you know, different environments that um, have happened over the years or different situations. And we know from our own internal investigations with um, what we call SIF, serious injuries uh, frequency, it's something that constantly is, is there with the risk that we are, are um, working with. Competency is a, you know, a big part of that. So we wanted to talk you know, today um, around how with the transport and lifting increases that have happened, We've also seen in our personal lives increases in our, our um, technology. Picture in front of you shows in the early 80s what would have involved um, you know, some of the personal tools that people had to be entertained and, and take videos and listen to the radio and all the rest of it. Today with innovation and, and technology, it's simply in an iPhone with an app or any other kind of smartphone. So we've seen that technology increase exponentially over the years. We've also seen um, technology that facilitates um, a community approach and coming together. Um, so some of the uh, areas like Airbnb, Alibaba, Facebook, Uber have all really created a community that the um, cost of entry is very low. People can jump into these situations or these particular communities for very little and, and it's allowing anyone to be involved in these different industries or these different um, activities, whatever they might be. So with all of that in mind and knowing that our, that our industry is pretty high risk, we've got um, training and competency issues continually. You see a picture there of our PTC crane simulator. So this is something that had been developed um, to allow people to um, really make mistakes and learn from, from lifting heavy pieces of, um, of equipment or modules into place using a simulator approach. So it's similar to the, the airline industry. What um, though we did find it still isn't enough. We just sometimes have technology or, or a basic understanding um, or limited understanding on what people understand from a knowledge standpoint. So we were really looking for something as Mammut, we were looking for something to create a consistent approach to measuring competency. So we find given that we're in a global, uh, a global environment that we're constantly dealing with different jurisdictions having different levels of, of um, competency or expectations or standards related to crane and rigging. Um, we wanted also to reduce our incident rates. So we knew there was a correlation between our training and competency and the incident rates. You know, sometimes when we did the root cause analysis, we found that there were um, training gaps or deficiencies in our, in our approach. Um, depending on the region or the jurisdiction we were in, it might be it might be different. So we really wanted to see a uh, reduction in our overall incident rates. Um, we also wanted to see something that would improve our regulatory compliance and specifically due diligence. Most Western countries and, and obviously in, in all parts of the world, there's an element of due diligence that we've done everything we can to prevent incidents from happening. Um, it's always easy after the fact to identify what went wrong and, and we obviously wanted to be able to find a, a solution to identifying on a proactive basis where our gaps were in knowledge or the technical side of our, of our um, crane operators and riggers. We wanted also a system that we could create the ability to have pinpoint accuracy on learning objectives and where people's strengths and, and improvement areas were. We wanted to eliminate unnecessary training. So with some of the improvements in technology now, we can really look at 
focusing in on the areas that are deficient with an individual and help those individuals learn specific areas as opposed to a paint everyone with the same brush and train everybody to the same level. So really that was one of the objectives that we wanted to, um, to put into place. So with that in mind, what we did was we, we came across a, a situation where a company in northern Canada in the tar sands, uh, Fort McMurray, um, called Suncor, they were using um, a tool called the International Competency Assessment Board, or ICAB. So we really started to look at what they were doing and started to apply it to crane operators and, and riggers in terms of the objectives that we wanted to people, uh, the people in our company to, um, to understand. So with that, what we did was we, we created um, the connection with ICAP to try and actually establish a crane and riggers competency assessment. So our leadership, you know, obviously is fully on board with this and participating, and we wanted to obviously, um, you know, expand this more. So, so with that introduction, what I wanted to do was turn over um, the rest of the um, discussion here on competency to Rob. All right. Thank you, Sheldon. Um, before we get going, I let, make sure people understand as far as my perspective is a little bit different from Sheldon's in that my, the majority of the work, the facilitation I've done in regards to competency programs, including the ICAB one, has been with owner clients. So it's usually probably your, the client organization, the multinationals that are trying to manage the risk of uh, all the different sub-trades and the internal activities that they're doing uh, directly. And so and although Sheldon, when, when he was talking in the beginning, his audience for this was obviously the crane operators, the riggers, EHS personnel within the crane you know, operation, operator companies. It's also of interest in, and want desire to be used by uh, you know, clients you know, as far as that, uh, the personnel they have that hire or oversee or even riggers get free access to these type of tools through the ICAP process that are involved in these kind of craning and rigging activities. So there's a wider audience obviously just even the, the craning and rigging industry itself. Um, before we get too far, it's probably good to just make sure we're talking the same language. Uh, what I mean by that is when we say the word competency, um, when you look at the different jurisdictions around the world, you know, there's always a different regulatory and legal definition for them. And I put three examples here on the page, and the, the UK, uh, United States, and Canada. And without getting into the detail of it, and these are just three jurisdictions I have and all the research I've done, we've yet to find one that didn't align in this one way, is that they all have four characteristics in common. Uh, one being uh, that training is, or sorry, that competency is developed through training, through qualifications, through experience. And those are ways that it could be developed, but a person could be competent and not have specific training, or could be competent and not have set qualifications. And especially with global companies, you know, probably have seen that where you may want to transfer a person from one jurisdiction to another and knowing that they have the competency but trying to you know demonstrate it from a regulatory or legal perspective you're trying to bring these things together but the last aspect that all of them also include is the, the ability to perform or do undertake certain responsibilities or activities to articulate to you know complete work or jobs in that way so there's four criteria there. So training is only only one of um, these activities. So um, keep in mind, if you, looking at the next slide here, what it does, and I'm sorry, my screen just updating here. So what it does here, when you look at things like competency and training, is that training is one aspect, the overall characteristics of competency. And you'll see here we got ability, you know, a competent person to be reasonable. They should be at the first things. Um, they should have practical thinking. Um, all those things are characteristics that come into the play. But I think they're wiped out completely just by the one aspect of somebody being trained. And obviously not the case, but training is a good way of developing it. But again, in this marketplace, um, we need to look at that as being only one of the ways. So give you some background on this on the ICAB tool. So, our, so the ICAB tool that we're talking about utilizing here is part of what's called the International Competency Assessment Board or ICAB Foundation. So this is a nonprofit organization and I'll tell you first of all what it's not. Um, they are not a certifying body. They do not uh, test and, as far as, and you know provide a passing score or grade or any kind of bar and, and they don't deem people competent or not competent. 
simply just providing a tool that allows organizations, um, in this case, um, this, you know, grouping of uh, craning and rigging organizations, to actually make a, a suppository of all the, these possible questions that they believe together would give an indication of competency. Again, not by itself, because obviously competency is more than just, say, using a computer program. It would also include, you know, practical application. But so as far as ICAB, they provide assessments that are divided into like 81 separate jurisdictions, um, 34 distinct industries. So as you can imagine, um, it's, the assessments are varied and often uh, jurisdictionally specific. Um, in this case, we're, we're actually going to be talking about one that is actually not jurisdictionally specific, but one that actually would be international, usable uh, across all the jurisdictions, uh, recognizing, you know, more the laws of physics, um, that rule, I guess, overrule or um, that manage, you know, the rigging industry, craning and rigging industry. So other things, Deb, just you're aware, um, as far as their mandate as a foundation, they have a very narrow mandate that, mandate that they're allowed to do. Uh, first is just to administer competency assessments for individuals and to provide, you know, the metrics or the data that comes out the other end, uh, not only for the individuals, but cumulatively for staff or all the personnel that are involved or industry trends, that type of thing. Um, it's designed to actually be able to allow organizations and individuals to demonstrate their due diligence in relation to that the competency definitions, but unable to demonstrate the, their ability to uh, address situation scenarios that often are difficult to recreate. And Sheldon mentioned there with the simulator. Uh, or industries trying different ways to find ways to recreate these situations. And the last one there is to that those em employment vulnerable groups. What they mean that is students, young workers, uh, people being retrained through either uh, employment compensation programs because of a workplace injury or retrained because of it uh, through reemployment or moving industries that way. And to allow these individuals to actually gain access to these tools. And so they provide assessments. Any assessment that, that we put out there, it's always one for one. Anyone that's being used, one is also given for free. What's on the slide now is really the cognitive competency bottle. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And what it's mainly saying, this is a, a, it was a study that was done and it's been, op I think, probably going back now almost 30 years. And they did this study and been confirmed over and over again. And you'll see by the graph there, what it's trying to indicate. And what it's showing there is an unskilled skilled individual, and that blue line is the confidence level, that when they get a little bit of training and get experience, their confidence level will spike to a level they'll likely see and never see again in their entire career. I know this is something that I've felt internally. I've seen myself do it. Um, spike up there, think that I know and have all the knowledge that I need, to, that I need because of my training and experience, and then over or experience, more or less, by making mistakes, by accidents happening, it the, my confidence level comes down. But in reality, my competence level is likely, you know, increasing. So the bias is showing that not only do individuals at the beginning of that, that this graph have a you know illusion of superiority as far as their ability, but also individuals at the other end are often underestimating their actual level of confidence. Uh, mainly because they've learned that they they know that there's a lot that they don't know, and uh, this tool allows people to on both ends of this scale to I guess to understand more what they know, what they don't know, where their opportunities are to continually learn. No, oh, perfect. Um, let's see. Sorry, the next one. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is the actual assessment process. Um, to give you an overview here. What happens in, in these assessments is an online tool. So individuals will go in, start their assessment. Um, and this is a quick overview. They will then get their results that will come out the other end. But it doesn't stop there. It's just an assessment as a tool. It also allows for uh, development for individuals to look at their assessment, determine where their, where their weaknesses are, and select them you know, for treatment. And when they do select them, guidance documents, um, it could be YouTube videos uh, from you know manufacturers, uh, reference informations, information. All those things are then made available and organized for them. 
so they can help them in the their development in that area. Right? And keep in mind, ICAP um, they don't provide any kind of training or resources or you know anything else outside of their mining what's out there in industry and providing it there for the users. All right. So as far as the process itself, when we look at the actual assessments, they're assessing people at four what's called functional levels. And what they mean by those four levels, individuals first are assessed the ability to recognize, and that's the, the bottom one of uh, recognize equipment, uh, recognize terms, and recognize the hazards or the risks associated with that. So as you can imagine, uh, this if to have a level of competency, that's the ideal place to start. If I were to talk about a, an industry outside of craning and rigging and start throwing out terms, um, like a, I think LD50 or something like that, it wouldn't mean a lot. So therefore, going to higher levels wouldn't mean a lot. Um, and you've probably all seen individuals in your career that um, started learning uh, the terms, but actually even recognize the equipment if you put it in front of them. So they start with a level. If people you know, do well at that level, it goes up to a comp level, which is really taking that level knowledge, putting into multiple situations. Interpretation is looking at how it's been interpreted by, you know, by industry as far as, um, say, a, appropriateness to the situation, um, how something would work in different situations that way. And the last level is application. These are scenario-based situations or questions that are put forward to the individual that are largely derived from past uh, serious incidents or fatalities, uh, major incidents that have occurred and allowing the individuals to actually try to answer the question as far as what they would do if they were faced with a certain situation and hopefully seeing, allowing them to demonstrate that they would make the decisions that didn't result in the, the serious incident or fatality. Um, sorry, one second. <coughs> Um, this process, just so you know, is all an online process, um, so it doesn't require any extra facilitation. That's why it's been actually worked quite well with uh, large multinational owner clients. People can actually go through it from any part of the world. And what this is showing is they have a proctoring uh, process that's, in, that's engaged or is part of their system that allows individuals to take their picture, show their ID, and actually go through the assessment, whether it be you know, at home, in a foreign country, hotel room, um, it wouldn't matter at all. So, um, The other things to let you know as far as when the data comes out, often people uh, focus on the idea that this data, when we start collecting data on assessment, that we're looking at the individual. Um, speaking for the, the companies that I've worked with, um, that's not where the interest is. The interest is more at an organizational or a team level or an industry level. Um, often, all of us, you know, it's often we know you know, the have a, at least a, a gut feeling or an intuition as far as the competency of people we work with directly. But how do we know, what can we say for an entire organization or a division in a different country? Do we have any gaps? And for the owner clients that I've worked with in the past, they're also looking as far as how do the gaps of an entire organization correlate with the work scope that they're dealing with? And this, being able to demonstrate this has been a, a great added level of confidence from those owner clients to, to be able to understand the, the contractors that they are utilizing have the ability or you know demonstrated ability and cumulative competency of their work teams in order to manage the risk even though we understand that uh, with all of us where competency will degrade over time um, people will get hired people will get fired uh, technology will change manufacturers will come up with new and creative ways of doing things and so obviously we need to continually manage this almost like prevent an instance of people as opposed to equipment it gives us that ability to have that incident and monitor and measure that. So, what I want to do is actually take you next and, and just show you some of the actual data that's been coming out of the current system, and, and it probably will give you an idea of where um, Moot saw the initial possibility, but also saw that there was an opportunity to improve on it. So, the data that I have in front of you here, this is something that actually I had is data that's actually real data. We took the company names out. And this, the bars are simply showing how well individuals uh, performed for all the different companies. Uh, and this is case we has to do with uh, the gray bars for cranes, hoists, lifting devices, and rigging all grouped together. Um, and then another one, specification and certification. 
This is what the ICAB tool had access in regards to craning and rigging, and they had it all lumped into one, uh, which, and it's all jurisdictionally specific on the assessments that this data was pulled from. So obviously that is not incredibly, you know, maybe valuable to a large organization like a sunk or energy to look at an organization's ability, you know, as a whole, you know, a large work scope. But it's not very valuable to a company like Mammut that's saying, okay, if we are low in that area, where are we low? And so the whole idea of this process is to use the tool that's there that can house and administer and, and move these assessments forward, but let's more or less blow up a jurisdictional assessment into this international craning and rating assessment so that instead of just saying that you know your company is at a cumulative basis is operating at this interpretation level, we can actually look at it in more detail and say, but how are doing it something specific charts? Or what about crane mechanics? Or what about low transfer? And so then we get actually specific information in those areas. And now training can be pinpointed or mentorship or whatever, however it's felt that needs to be addressed, it can now be addressed specific to that area instead of, you know, just as a kind of a broad uh, sweeping type in endeavor. And I think we'll, we will see that and uh, the industry changing the whole and starting to try to solve gaps and manage gaps as opposed to just treating everyone um, almost like they're, you know, all human beings are the same and putting everyone through the exact same process. <clears throat> so as far as nonprofit or as far as using this tool, how it's being used, the different organizations have seen or why it's being used is mainly because it allows for a level of standardization that is, you know, can't be done within internal uh, companies by themselves. Uh, allows new technology and input to come from different sections of the industry and actually be utilized or influence the rest of the industry. Um, as well, you'll see there with a gavel from a, a legal point of view, it adds some interesting value to organizations in the fact that when an accident occurs, you can imagine it's very difficult to say after something goes wrong that the personnel were competent at everything that they needed to be. And often that's where the regula regulators looking, whether there's that level of competence. This tool then more or less is allowing them to quantify and manage you know, that information and also look at what's, what's the rest of industry doing. And if I've looked at the industries, for example, um, you know, when we talk about building houses, working on the roofs, doing shingling, very transient industry, the very best in that industry uh, may still have significant issues. And we may find in certain industries in certain jurisdictions, the availability of, you know, um, riggers or crane operators or, you know, even health and safety personnel with the knowledge needed may be very difficult to obtain. And you may have the best of the best and be developing, but still not be have perfection in those areas. So it allows for that. Um, the other, as far as the expense and quality, that type of thing, obviously having a system that's existing that doesn't need to be developed um, saves a lot on, on cost. Um, the well, large organizations I've dealt with have tried in different ways to manage these costs. It can cost millions of dollars to try to create some sort of tool similar. Um, this one here, what I want to show you is the guy that's coming out of it. And so you get a rough idea. There's going to be just a quick high level There's different ways that you can look at the data. In this one, you're looking at a, it's kind of a bullseye or a, um, a radial graph. And as the dots get closer to the, the middle, that's more or less, that's the higher their score is. Uh, the green line there being the industry average and the gray line being the target. Um, so as organizations, as individuals you know, do their assessments, they'd be plotted on this one type of graph. But this type of information, allows us to see and look at uh, maybe a job, a company, or a work scope specific to how people are doing by their responsibility level. And you'll notice in this one, this is real data. I won't tell you where it's from, but this is real data. And you can see the supervision that they have are by far um, performing or be able to assess and demonstrate their, their abilities at a much higher level than, say, even the, you know, the uh, EHS advisors or health and safety staff that are there to advise and help them. And that's something is an interesting trend that can be used in action, you know, and, and uh, action to be taken on it. So the next one here, 
um, it starts showing the data in a slightly different way. And so what this is showing is the peak level of competency for an entire group. So again, not looking at an individual level, but an organization level. This is where the large multinational organizations I've worked with will use this data to, to see whether, not whether the company says that they can do something, but whether they actually have the staff accumulately the ability to manage it that way. And uh, so you can see from the different areas, you can see the farther you go to the right that there's someone within the organization with that skill set and that ability. Oh, the data can be that other ways. So we can actually move it and go from an organizational level, as we have right now, to the next day. And so this would be a, like a, a work team, a work crew. You can see we're able to keep splitting this data and get more detail, more detail. And in this case, now we could actually look, instead of at a company level or a division, we can look at an actual work team. Um, you know, and look at look at things that are specific to them. The examples here I was pulling from, uh, again, real data that was coming out of one of the jurisdictions, and we're able to look and see how does, you know, working close to water on ice affect this, you know, affect this work scope. This as well, when it comes to some international training and rigging and stuff, we can look at something like how, uh, like load transfer or, or engineered lift, and we can see how does that particular area relate to the type of work that's been going on. So, okay. If we take it to one, and there's a little bit of data that's, uh, that we have, I'm going to show here, um, that's going to show based on some of the testing that's been done of the assessment tool. But I forgot about this one. Before I get there, of course, this process also allows individuals to get their data and feedback. In this case, this is actually showing the bars, type of graphs that they would have access to. Um, the blue bar is showing how well the individual did in that area, and the gray bar is a self-assessment, how they thought they were going to do. And this, I thought, put this data on there because I thought it was interesting. If you see the last one there, it says exposure measurement and monitoring. Again, this is a, a jurisdictional assessment, not the craning rigging one. But in this case, this was somebody that had an extensive background in that area but hadn't done anything actively for 12 years. And the industry changed, you know. And they changed, their confidence level was still very high, but they're, what they're able to demonstrate, their actual knowledge and be able to recognize equipment, they didn't get out of that level. They're stuck at that recognizing equipment, understanding terms, understanding the associated risk. And obviously in the craning and rigging industry, the technology, the equipment is changing quite dramatically as well. Right. So the next one here actually shows some of the data. And this is preliminary, this is test data, so I wouldn't take it to the bank. Um, but as far as what we're finding on the, the test, you know, the testing of the control groups that are going through and using the uh, international training assessment questions and the assessment process, process that's in place right now, is they were seeing, this. you can see here, um, said so crane mechanics at a very high level, even that, that line, the dotted line there, is showing that the average and the blue line is showing the peak. So we've said, saying for crane mechanics, the peak is all the way to the end, the average is rather high. Engineered lift studies, rather low. Hardware, again, rather high, right to the peak. Load charts, there. Load transfer, lower. I wouldn't count this data in saying that's predictive, but when you actually have you know, thousands of points of data across multiple companies, then this data can be extremely uh, valuable and predictive and to organizations trying to manage the risk and understand where their training needs are. And instead of just trying to train everyone on everything, they can start pinpointing and making having uh, training or developer mentoring specific to those requirements. Okay. All right, so looking at the next one here, sorry, I got ahead of my slides here very quickly. I have a habit of doing that. <laughs> so one thing to know, so now you understand the different data that's in there and it'll, it'll demonstrate where organizations are at. The gray area here will show you shows you more or less that organizations will be able to actually define their own targets. So it's not like the ICAB Foundation would actually create uh, a target or an expectation as far as for someone within your organization how well they should do, you know, this, an area like wire rope, you know. So is that what level should it be? But that's something left to the organization itself because your organization may have very limited use or very uh, restricted use in that one area. So the other things uh, to note here is the, the fact that 
this process, by defining your own targets, allows organizations, allows the data to actually be analyzed and they have other tools that allow you to analyze that against your own targets. So you can see where you're going, what progresses you made at an organizational level, which again is much easier than trying to manage it at an individual level for each employee on an ongoing basis. So the, in the last, I think it's one of the last ones I have here as far as uh, integrated development planning and resources. What, the, what that's saying is more or less when individuals do say we have areas that we want to develop on or the organization say these are areas we want to focus our development on or below our targets where we want to be, the process actually allows and provides individuals with very specific uh, links. It could be a video link to um, something, you know, uh, Crosby has a lot of videos out there. It could be something specific from a manufacturer. And this is information as well that through a, a community of crane, craning and rigging operators can actually start pushing this information in so we can make sure that that information is available and accessible to staff on an ongoing basis. And I think that's the one thing is it allows this whole process to be, a, I guess, allows a community of organizations to actually work together and actually develop a process that benefits all uh, across the board. Sheldon, I'll throw this one back to you. All right. Thanks, Rob, for the summary. Um, well, as you can see from the review that, that Rob did is this is a, a tool that really helps to pinpoint where, where issues on competency are. What Mammut really saw as an opportunity, um, given our position in the market, we are a market leader within the heavy lift and transport industry. What we were finding is we, and, and many of you on the call may find that you're recycling the same people, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but your, your same individuals are moving around from our company to another company. We were discovering and finding that um, individuals that come to us may have, have training and competency issues that are either industry-wide or individual-based, but those people would circulate and leave, leave us and maybe go to another company. So we looked at this as an opportunity to really help improve the industry. Um, many of our clients um, have identified heavy lift and transport as a high risk critical activity on their sites um, just given the potential problems when something goes wrong. So with that in mind we saw this as, a, as really an opportunity to help bring the, the crane and rigging community together and facilitate an improvement initiative that really helps to take the industry to the next level. Um, personally from my standpoint I don't want to be I don't want to be known in the industry as a high-risk group that comes onto site and, and everyone's scared and, and nervous that the work that we're doing could cause a major issue. Uh, you know, we're all above that. And I think um, any way that we can use this through an innovative new technology to help improve that is really what we were trying to, um, you know, encompass. So, you know, from a standpoint of insurance, regulators, um, even the clients, they've been asking how can we improve our industry? What, what are we going to do to make it um, different? Um, what's been working or what's been um, happening has not been working, you know, is what I would, what I would say. Um, and Sheldon, Sheldon, I just wanted to throw in there is one of the things, when we, what you're saying there is more as by having the ability to measure, you know, measure and monitor competency and instead of making this, this vague type of thing uh, that's kind of floating out there, the ability to measure it and if we a common tool, use the compiler while us we actually start managing this. What we what I've found throughout the organizations I've worked with, competency in the past has been something it's almost like being in the, you know, the movies of the mafia. Like he's one of us. It's it's almost like that's the only way of, of understanding. If they got the training, well we don't count. Can't say if they're trained that therefore they're competent, but then we're relying on someone else that knows him and says you know, he's a good guy, he's competent. Uh, but the reality is none of us are actually competent, you know, at everything. And I don't think anyone would say that everyone's competent at creating a re and cross the board because I'm sure there's type of specialty or division or type of equipment where an individual is going to have some areas of weakness. And you may be better at, in, you know, creating a rig in a refinery or a foundry situation and not so good at minus 40 up in uh, the oil sands. Yeah, very good point. It's, it's something where um, this tool really helps to um, create some common ground amongst everybody in the industry. So, so what we saw is for those of us in the industry to solve the issues by the industry. 
one of the things that we've seen, just a couple of graphs to show you, um, over the, the short while that, that we've been involved in some of this, um, we've seen our leadership engagement you know, increasing and our serious incidents actually declining. So the two graphs in front of you really show that as one goes up, the leadership engagement, those serious incidents go down. And we feel like the um, initiatives like we're speaking here, um, especially around training and competency, it really gives us the ability to focus in on training and it's very tangible. It's not just training for the sake of training. And I think then leaders see much more value in um, in this sort of a tool when they can objectively see that this is a deficiency or an area of improvement that someone has and help a learning plan be established for those individuals. To add to that, Sheldon, as far as in all the implementations I've been involved with and when we're looking at data like this, we're able to pull the data post-incident uh, for you know an entire crew um, and you can look at the cumulative competency. And so to date, we found 100% correlation where there's gaps in cumulative competency and where our high-risk incidents are occurring. Um, the other thing, that, and again, there's a lot of data we can pull out of the system. The other thing is we're finding a 60, 80% uh, difference between how individuals self-assess, where they think their competency is at, and where they're able to demonstrate it. And again, those are correlating directly to high-risk incidents. All right. Um, so the um, slide here really is referring to some of the outcomes that, that we are, have achieved, continue to want to achieve, and, and just really looking at moving this forward. Um, with this approach, we're seeing um, the training expenditures can be targeted based on need. We're going to be able to reduce our actual fo uh, cost related to the, to the targeted training. And regardless whether the training budgets are, are reduced or not, we're still able to demonstrate a larger degree of due diligence, meaning um, if something were to occur after an event, through a tool like this, we can be very specific around um, this individual's competencies, the learning plan, and all of the other elements that make this up really help to demonstrate that due diligence argument that we've done everything we can as a company um, to identify the issues to help those um, individuals improve and continue to move um, not only that individual but the company or the industry as a whole together. So it really just tell, it gives us the ability to um, to uh, focus in on on certain decisions as well when we're looking at the data. Yeah. I have to throw in there as well, there's also increased motivation by individuals when this data, when your data, it's kind of almost like your Facebook account, if you're unemployed, you don't have to tell somebody to update their Facebook. And as well, when you're looking at competency data, if, um, if a certain area, um, say engineered lift studies, is important to what I do, is critical to the type of work scopes I do, you don't need to tell the individuals. Individuals know it. And by the, having some uh, transparency in that data between that individual and their supervisor and able to go back or within a department or division, what we've found is organizations within organizations, individuals are developing on their own. They're using the, the free tools that are out there, the resources that are on the web, to actually develop and, on an ongoing basis. Uh, we had uh, one project was over well, 15, uh, over $15 billion construction project uh, that was using this, and they did not add, through this process, they did not actually add any additional training um, offerings to their personnel, yet they made dramatic improvements. In reality, they actually were able to drop some are make more streamline it. So they're able to reduce their training costs while actually increasing the actually training involvement there and actually ask, you know, looking for training that's very specific to the areas where they need it. Um, probably the last one I want to jump down, some of we mentioned as we went through, but the last one here is the ability uh, for an organization to demonstrate this, their due diligence um, through the management of workforce competency. And a lot of times, and we, we've already all seen it, where you see the court case where somebody's up on the, on the stand or you're reading the testimony and they talk about that they have this certification or this training, that type of thing. And then they quickly just move on from that, um, mainly because they want to start looking at the, you know, the faults or the mistakes that an individual may have made as they're going through it. This type of data shows that an organization is doing what is reasonably, impra reasonable practical, reasonably practical to do to manage the competency of its personnel, of its workforces, divisions, that type of thing. And it's something that I think would be of you know, value when you think of the training and rigging industry and able to show that this is what we're doing. We're, we're managing this, comp, this competency. It's not something we, we did once. We did this a check sheet or a form and then moved on.
All right, so just uh, to recap and summarize, what we're really trying to do um, is support the development of an international crane and rigging assessment using ICAB. ICAB. What we're trying to do is, um, as, a, as Mammut, is really um, create something that's more efficient for use of time and cost. We want to we wanna help facilitate some of the discussions within a, um, an industry that obviously has some some um, high levels of knowledge and skill, just wanting to help fine tune that and and not only look at existing um, competencies and, and knowledge, but try and improve that um, through ongoing issues that keep coming up. So um, we're capturing lessons and learning, and this tool allows us to continually feed that back in. So the the objective really is is to create that that community uh, of like-minded individuals from. Um, from really individually looking at a problem to trying to solve it as a, as a community and as a whole we're going to improve where we are currently um, at the, at this sorry Sean I was just going to say I think there's and I think there's also a lot of power in having the craning and rigging industry more or less be the ones that are actually steering this going forward and like you're saying it's collaborative but also then that there's they're steering it because obviously with these types of tools and the large organizations that are out there um, that are using, you know, similar, you know, this tool. Um, it's, I guess, the best way to say is, we want the crane and crane rigging to manage it and be able to control this themselves and not have some uh, this process be developed by, you know, maybe owner clients um, that may think they have all the the knowledge that they need for it, but are never going to be able to keep keep it up to date, keep it current, uh, like the actual industry could itself. Yeah, and, and regulators or insurance providers as well. We don't want um, necessarily a group from outside the industry to tell us how we're going to solve this issue. And I think, you know, if we can, what I've observed from from my standpoint within the industry is um, everyone trying to solve this particular problem, but individually, but collectively, we're going to be much more powerful um, in solving it. It just seems like um, various jurisdictions and other other organizations all all have a you know sometimes a difficulty coming together and, and establishing a common ground so again given Mahmoud's position in the market this was our our uh, view that we really would help facilitate um, some, some common ground it is is really knowing that as an industry we need to improve and unless someone steps forward we're, we're not necessarily going to see that um, change obviously we've got technology that can support us on this um, the ICAP foundation just speaking to the slide um, that you see now is is global. So the UK, Australia, um, there's Canada, uh, the US. There's various groups that um, have been involved in this to this point. Um, so the involvement in, includes up you know ten companies, ten plus companies uh, through all four countries. And so it is multi-jurisdictional. It is it is um, something where um, hopefully this will continue to feed in using new technology and and the concept around training. And I wanted to, you know, offer up a special thanks to ITI. Um, when we first discussed this with Zach um, a year ago, um, it was something that that he could see the value in this new concept of of um, pinpointing people's needs with training, but also identifying where their strengths were. Um, we're going to see more and more of that, and and obviously this seminar this morning um, or this afternoon, depending on where you're at, really is meant to start that discussion. What can we do to, to help move this forward? So what we're trying to do now is really look at building um, that community. So I mentioned um, uh, earlier that we've got a number of companies involved in four different countries. We want to see that increase and continue to expand and so we're trying to build improvement teams, I'll call them, but smaller pockets of individuals who are willing to use the tool, uh, provide knowledge um, through questions, revising questions, making it more than what it is today and continue to build on it. And, and what I'm finding is everybody's solving that particular problem individually, but as a whole collective whole, we're not, we're not solving the issue. And so we're hoping to get more people involved and interested in the participation on this. So and we're just... So Shell, I was going to add there as far as when we talk about involvement and you hinted at it, there, sorry, it could be a matter of just reviewing questions or providing questions that they believe that they already have, or it could be just a matter of saying, "Here's some amazing, you know, resources that we found that'll be useful, so that when individuals are developing, they have access to that 
information. So it could be, you know, the range of involvement can be, uh, you know, from very lean to very extensive depending on the organization and their ability. Yeah, yeah, very good point, Rob. And I think um, to this point, we've had individuals and companies that have reviewed questions, given feedback on the questions, have um, added questions to the database, have given information on the um, training uh, that might be available for a particular objective. And so we're really just looking at pooling that information and continually building it. And so, you know, so at this point, what we're looking for is we have, um, through the ICAB Foundation, the ability to um, do three assessments at this point until the end of April. Um, obviously, the funding model that ICAB uses, this isn't, this isn't something that um, is, is um, without cost. Obviously, we, we would love to make it free, um, but there is some, um, some nonprofit uh, elements that go into this with the ICAB Foundation in terms of offering these assessments to students or various people in the trade. And so we want to make sure that, that um, we're building this from a, a standpoint of getting as many people as we can involved between now and the end of April. And obviously where it goes from here is, is um, the next step. But wanting anybody on the call who hears this and is interested in being involved to contact me at the email address that you see below um, and, and really just starting to build this community. And so we're going to be speaking on this topic more and more over the coming months and continuing to work with groups like ITI to build this, but hoping others will become involved. <coughs> Anything to add on that, um, Rob? No, I think you summed it up well. All right, that, uh, that essentially is the presentation. Um, any, any questions, I'll maybe turn it over to you, Zach, to see if any questions have come in from any of the participants. Sure. Good job, guys. There were several questions that came in. Uh, the first one, some of them around assessment uh, and methodologies here, but um, if you can see my screen, guys, that how can you know someone isn't assisting the candidate? So this, Rob, would be a question for you. How does the proctoring, how is proctoring really handled? Sure, actually, a great question, and that's something that actually is not just on this assessment, but is a lot of online training. Um, it's always a, a concern. Um, so what happens there to get more details? So an individual, first of all, will take a picture of their, you know, themselves, um, and they want to compose for it. And that one, because potentially some companies use it for ID things like that. Then they go to another one where they take a picture of their government issued photo ID, and in both cases, the computer, this computer technology actually verifies that the individual is there and uses facial recognition technology. That information, the the individual's ID and who the person is, is compared to make sure, first of all, that it is that individual. So the ID verification has occurred. But then what happens throughout that, then throughout the rest of the assessment, this screen that you see pops off to the, the side and it actually continually monitors the individual throughout the process. And that is on a recorded basis. So that is in reviewed not only by a human being after, but also on an on, you know, active basis by this facial recognition technology. So it allows, if another face comes into that screen, it will immediately flag it, send it for, you make sure that obviously is reviewing it. And that individual, that initial ID, is the same one throughout the entire process. Yeah, what uh, the second part of this too, I think they were concerned about, you know, potentially for instance, someone standing behind the computer feeding them information verbally. Is, can the video pick up additional sounds or voices? Yeah, they'll be giving access when they do it. They, of course, with anything on computers, you have to authorize that access. And they'll give access to both their microphone and camera. Um, and that was my initial thought. You know, when I first you know heard about this, it was the same thing. But the other thing we found, that the level of, um, I guess, the ability for somebody to cheat any system is always there. Um, because again, even in universities, you know, they're acknowledging those things like inner ear mics and Google glasses and everything else that they're not able to manage completely. Um, you know, so I'm sure we can find a situation, but what we're finding already that is it would be easier, it's much easier for a person just to develop and learn than to try to create a sophisticated, um, you know, mirrors and sign language. Sure, sure. Just to add uh, to that, and, oh, yeah. um, just to add to that as well, I think that goes back to the foundation of how this might be rolled out and and what 
I really try and encourage people to understand that this isn't a tool to identify good and bad. It's a tool to help develop. And so test, as soon as you hear the term test, which this is not, the term test seems to indicate, you know, you pass or fail. Well, that's not the case with, with competency and where we're trying to take it, um, not only as, as an industry, but also as, as um, I think where training providers are going, is really identifying where the needs are um, with that individual and helping them develop. And so if they're worried about cheating the system, they're actually cheating themselves in terms of their development. And I think that that's maybe a, a change that needs to happen. But it depends on how people use it, obviously. And, and I've really been trying to push the fact that this is a development tool as opposed to a good and bad. Yeah. That's a good point. Cool. And even, I should say, even when they do flag and find that there's maybe some, they got extra assistance from somebody else, the data is still made available. It's just, it's made available with, the notation decided that it's unverified and as far as it could have somebody else could have been or was helping them um, but uh, you know but still it's there for that developmental resource sure okay great uh, next question what was the scope of implementation for Mammut thus far Sheldon so for instance was this just at Suncor or how many sites did you guys uh, do this at and the number of personnel the roles involved meaning um, transport folks, rigging folks, crane operators, cost, time, and energy. So we're really at the beginning stages of this. Um, uh, this tool has just now been created, and so it's really just um, primarily the four countries, which are um, the UK, Canada, Australia, and the US, are, are looking at, at some of this now to use. But it's an ongoing building process, so it's not fully implemented across the board in, in Mammut. Obviously, we have uh, various languages and other um, restrictions that, that sometimes hinder the competency process. So we're really using this right now as a pilot to try and um, pinpoint where our needs are. And, and it's an ongoing development. It's an ongoing improvement opportunity that, that we see, um, but it's growing. And so it, it comes down to um, primarily in, in um, the Alberta region right now is where the, the major testing. I guess Alberta and Ontario is the two primary spots. But I would say because of the, the prior testing that had been done in Alberta through the jurisdictional type assessments, um, they're further ahead and understanding how this can, can actually help them in that particular area. So from my role as a global uh, CQ person, I see this opportunity globally in terms of, um, of uh, regions that are on board. We're, we're expanding it as this pilot uh, finishes up. So. The cost, time, and energy to implement is still in the works. It's still obviously um, moving forward and, and going. Um, in terms of an individual's time to do this, it is um, 20 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on how, how competent that person is. The more competent they are, the longer it takes, because it moves up that level into the application size uh, or application um, side of questioning. So. You know, in terms of the direct costs, it's $125 to do the assessment. Right now we're in the pilot phase, so it's it's free, essentially. But um, you're also contributing then to um, journeymen or students that are that are moving up into the trade. So there's there's a one-to-one -one ratio. One of your assessments completed moves into, you know, a free assessment for somebody. So, so the cost really is as many people as you want to have implemented into it. And you know, the last part of that is energy. I think it really goes back to how, implement, how the implementation goes uh, and how far you want to take this is really up to the individuals is the development plan is really where the time and energy goes. Um, the assessment is one thing, but developing that individual after the fact rather than just doing a training class is really where we see the advantage. Is overall the energy ex exertion to get somebody competent should be less, but it's just a different approach. I sh should add to that because I think it might it might help. And Sheldon's talking specific, obviously, to this, you know, an international training rigging assessment development. But since I've been involved with other organizations that have implemented jurisdictional specific assessments in different parts of the world, uh, with owner, you know, owner clients and ICAB, I will say that as far as the process, because it's on demand, there's nothing that's being waited for because you know the data and the metrics and everything is there. Um, it's been actually probably the most time and time effective implementations that they've seen. Um, I'd say the one thing is if you are utilizing this for your staff, the most important thing and where you don't want to um, sk I guess skimp on any way is just in the communication of what the intent is. If people believe it's a test, a screening tool, especially in this type of market, 
um, then obviously you'll get one reaction. But uh, we spent the time in different organizations to make sure that individuals understand this is an investment in them to understand where their needs are so that the organization can help them and further them. And doing this type of thing is a sign of a professional. So, Sure. Uh, a follow-up question to that, Sheldon, would be, you know, is Mammut assessing all personnel preemptively in Alberta or on, in Ontario, for instance, um, and just bringing those reports uh, to the owner client or our owner clients driving this? So currently, no, there's no um, preemptive assessments. Um, you know, it goes back to what Rob was saying that, you know, in the market, this cre could create some some concern and fear. Um, that's that's obviously not the intent. It is meant to try and improve the industry, um, which again is why we want a collective approach on this. I personally um, am really wanting as my vision to be able to go back to the uh, trade associations, those groups within the province, the various provinces or, you know, in the U.S. or whatever other uh, location we're talking on and have those those institutions help us improve the competency and skill of our crane and rigging groups. So we're really, you know, right now in, in, in um, I guess, discussion with, with different groups that might help us um, help those members of their trade associations, help them improve before they come to the companies and, and apply. Um, but at some point, I would I would actually like to see this as a um, preemptive way of, of evaluating people coming in from various jurisdictions to ensure that they meet those minimum requirements that we want to see. Right now in, in Canada, as an example, there's 10 provinces, three territories. They all have their own approach to how they certify and deem someone a competent crane operator. Um, the U.S., you know, similar, there's various approaches. So. We have also Malaysian um, workforce that, that really is mobile and goes to various parts of the world. Um, they're good crane operators, but they don't necessarily follow one particular standard. They might follow a European approach. And so we're trying to collectively look at this from a global, a global scale to really set the bar at this stage and make sure everyone's at the same level. So if people get involved in this outside of, the, um, outside of Mammut and as an industry, uh, we can move this forward. We're going to be dealing with the root issue of the training may not be you know, um, completely in line right from the, the particular jurisdiction that does the training, if that makes sense. We might be able to go right back to where the deficiencies are in their current standard and help them improve that so when they do come to the workforce, um, we know that they are, are trained and competent. So, again, it's a... Go Sorry, ahead. Sheldon, I was just going to add to that as far as the second part of that, you know, owner clients, you know, our owner clients driving this was the second part of the question. And, you know, as... You know, working with the owner clients, this the international crediting and rigging was not uh, you know even thought uh, by owner clients, but was interested by their individuals internally because they have crane coordinators help state the individual planners um, that are involved. So there is interest in them uh, participating, being able to have access to you know this for their own staff. Good point. Okay, great. Uh, a couple more questions, guys. The uh, one question, Canada specific, uh, is Canada revising its operator and rigor certification program? Why not just rely on this? And guys, this this highlights the question of kind of certification versus what in the states we call qualification or just uh, competency assessment is similar, right? So Rob, this gets down to your definition slide in the very beginning. Um, so if you want to take a crack at this. You bet. And I'll, actually, what I'll do is I, because I have worked you know, globally around the world, and you know, I, um, for example, uh, I have an engineering background. I have a, a CSP designation, and other things that, in some in some people's uh, judgment, would allow me to do uh, lift drawings. Um, I don't consider you know that's not my area. It's not where I worked, and it's not where I should be should be doing that. I used to also be a, a firefighter, you know, in the military, um, and I I believe I was competent at the time. And I think I might be still, but it, honestly, I'm not the best judge of that. And what I'm getting at here is a lot of times certification programs are designed to actually allow people to demonstrate and meet a certain bar, um, but it, it doesn't actually allow people to go further. And they often have a lot of concerns as far as to, you know, to, you know, to let you know as far as we'll, we'll give you the certification, but just so you know, you also need to develop in these areas. That extra little thing isn't there. The hope here is this for this type of tool, it's a continual development model that organizations or individuals can utilize and keep going to the next level. You can have in there new technology, 
uh, new ways of doing things, new incidents and that type of thing that could be added in for continual development. But in, I, in my opinion, it, this should never be used as a certification model because then it moves it's completely a, a testing type structure. Organizations that do this or utilize it should be thinking of continual and ongoing development. Just to expand to that, um, Rob, we also we also know that if we did these assessments, there couldn't be feedback to the certification bodies then in terms of this this area seems to continually be um, showing low in, in the competency and, and highlight those areas and actually help to improve the industry again based on the assessment scores. So just because a certification body um, gives somebody competency or deems them competent or certifies them doesn't mean that we can't, like you were saying, feedback the, the information. So I see it as a part of the tool, not the tool. It's not the only tool. It's just part of an ongoing improvement initiative that, that we really feel will help make things more objective as opposed to sometimes different certification bodies have different pushes on what they think makes somebody competent. And, and as a whole, we're hoping to improve on that or at least give the feedback to them. Yeah, those are good points. I One thing I would add, guys, is that uh, a, th a, a task or an activity like crane operations, mobile crane operations, is pretty, pretty pinpointed in that it's it's the certification program works well for it because um, there's a set there's a standing and a standard pretty much for what the operator needs to know, although they might use different terms or whatnot across borders. Um, that it's pretty set the, uh, an activity like being a transport um, specialist or a rigging superintendent or a rigger, you know, those those roles or those job titles involve so many of just a variety of competencies and tasks, right? Where a crane operator in for NCCCO, there's five domains, I believe, you know, from crane setup and uh, load charts and so on, roles, responsibilities, etc. For a rigger, it's impossible to define what a rigger means to Keywood infrastructure versus Keywood offshore versus Mammut. You know that a rigger in those roles do so many different things. So it seems like ICAB competency assessment are so much more versatile in being able to build out assessments for all of the different tasks and activities that we're trying to just assess basic competency. And you can again take it from entry level all the way to application without a really really um, expensive and time-consuming our certification program, you know, which is really designed to um, meet now really meet a, a minimum threshold and in most jurisdictions be a regulatory requirement, for instance, for a crane operator like it is in the states. So I don't know if that helps as well, but that's the way I look at different activities that our workforce are doing. And Zach, I'd, I'd probably su support that with one other thing. Is not only different, you know, the areas, and, but it, well, think of the roles themselves. You will have health and safety personnel, supervision, management, um, even you know, client yeah, organizations. Right. And these again, it wouldn't make sense for all those, you know, to try to become a certified crane operator, certified rigger, in order to have an involvement in a work scope. And that's where this allows individuals to, you know, more or less determine where they're at, and then if they want to keep on developing or if the organization expects it, um, that they have that, you know, the process to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the last question I had in guys, is this really knowledge based or is there a skills hands on assessment available as well? So Rob? Sure. That's it that's a good point. And then you'll see even on the ICAB site, I do not believe that there is any way of doing it. Um, for example, knowledge base or cognitive type, you know, a competency assessment allows has some advantages because obviously it's lower cost than putting people through live practical uh, you know scenarios on an ongoing basis so there's some cost saving there it can be more standardized they can also use it for situations where you couldn't put someone in a live hands-on assessment like what would you do you know if and you name the emergency situation or high you know high wind or anything like that cold weather you can put people in those situations on the flip side, nobody should rely on a tool just like this, nor on the hands-on, because in the, in the hands-on side of it, you're going to get some very good, you know, practical experience, but obviously very costly as well, because and because obviously you need to have the equipment, you need to have the people doing it, and 
as such, there's some limitations there. But I think in the end, it should be a combination of the two. That's why this process will not deem competency, but it gives you a metric that can actually augment your internal systems to help with that. Yeah, yeah, good point. I think it's uh, the other thing, just the practicality of doing practical exams. Um, what a lot of companies will do is, in this sort of process, although it might not be ICAB, is written exams first and then practical um, job, you know, job task uh, qualifications in the field with a, you know, supervisor. But it's certainly not as easy to do. But um, I did like. I think Sheldon, when you first discussed this with me, you explained how um, the questions are starting to be very multiple choice that they can grow into simulation based type questions. That's similar to what a lot of the certifying bodies have done for the higher level certifications like the lift director certification for CCO is a, it's almost entirely a, um, there's uh, two exams I think and there, there's simulations built into them. You know, so it's, uh, that's the only real efficient way we can do it. And it's a good point, and if I didn't mention there, as far as these questions can, as you were referring to, can include, and they do include a lot of images, but they can include video, so you could actually show a situation, put somebody in that, you know, it more as immerse them in that environment, the uh, use of video, and then ask sure. them to develop on that. The other thing I can't help but, just because I'm always in the facilitation role, when we do talk about tests or exams, if you are communicating this with personnel, I found those automatically, in most people's minds, assume that there's a pass or fail. When if you think of a lot of the psychometrics process like a Myers-Briggs or personality or else when they truly an assessment, one of the things is it's not a pass or fail. It just simply gives you feedback that usually the individual and the supervisor are the only ones that can and whether you know, there's a gap there or not. Sure. Okay. Well, very good, guys. This has been an absolute treat having you both on here. I, um, we typically host about six of these with internal uh, sessions that ITI produces, and about six a year we have uh, different partners from the industry come on board. But this has been a really neat uh, opportunity to showcase ICAB and what Mammut's doing with it. This is, everyone, this is actually my login to ICAB. And as Sheldon said, uh, we're looking for people to get involved. So. With the presentation file you'll be receiving in a follow-up email, you'll have uh, Sheldon and Rob's emails, uh, as well as directions on how to uh, get involved with ICAB and how you see fit. So um, thank you so much for joining us. I want to leave it to, uh, actually, Sheldon, if you want to have the last word, I'll pass it to you, buddy. But thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Zach. I can't really add anything to it other than just looking for more involvement from from uh, the industry. And really, the start of a journey is is where we're at right now. And it's not the only solution; it's part of a solution as a whole to help improve our competency. So, I guess that's the summary I would give as a whole. So, email right. me if you need any more information. Hopefully, I hear from you um, from you guys. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. Have a great day, everybody. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.